Go ahead and open your Bibles if you have them with you. Hope you do. As my good friend Alan Hood always says. And open, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 60. Stuart gave such an excellent message for prophetic singers yesterday afternoon. Stuart Greaves, if you weren't here, you need to hear that teaching. If you're called as a singer, if you're called as a prophetic messenger in this hour of history, you need to hear that message. But he talked about being filled with an understanding of the eschatological landscape or the landscape of what the Lord is doing in the hour of Jesus' return on the earth that it's important as prophetic singers, as messengers, that we don't speak a message of our own heart, but that we are filled with the revelation of God's plan for His Son and what the Lord is doing on the earth. We are living in perilous times. We are living in an hour of great crisis, but I believe we are living in the hour of the church's greatest glory and greatest ministry in history as we prepare for the return of Jesus. And I want to touch a little bit of what God's plan is to look at the crisis of the hour, to familiarize us with the darkness that covers the earth in this hour. As those who live in the privileged West, the majority in this room live in the privileged West, I want to be bold and say that the majority of us in this room live a middle-class lifestyle in the West. Some of you say, I don't live a middle-class lifestyle in the West. Well, you live a wealthy lifestyle compared to the majority of people on the earth. And very often with our privilege and with our wealth and with our comfort, it is easy to be disconnected from the crisis of darkness that is blanketing the earth. And I believe understanding the condition of the earth is foundational for us to pray for God to release His plan on the earth. But furthermore, it's important that we understand what that plan is and how God is going to execute it. And so again, if we're going to sing the songs that usher in the kingdom, we have to know what the kingdom is. We have to understand what the kingdom is coming in response to. And we have to understand how it's going to be released. So turn with me to Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah 60 sets the framework for what the Lord is calling the people of God to in this hour. Isaiah 60 verse 1, arise and shine. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, the enemy has come in like a flood, as it says in Isaiah 59 verse 19. And the consequence is this, darkness covers the whole earth, and deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you. And His glory will be seen upon you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word this morning. Lord, we present ourselves before You this morning as those who have been brought from death into life. As those who have been brought from darkness into light. As those upon whom the glory of God has arisen by the Holy Spirit living on the inside. And we ask, Father, that you would instruct our hearts this morning. What is on your heart in this hour? I ask, Father, out of this room today, you would raise up men and women of understanding who would instruct others of your ways. You would raise up from this room the strong ones, the bold ones, the bright ones, those who would be strong in their spirit and would do great and mighty exploits for the Lord in an hour in which darkness covers the earth. Father, we pray along with Jesus 
that in this hour, your kingdom would come and your will would be done through the church on earth as it is in heaven. Father, I ask that your word would go forth this morning, this afternoon, and this evening, and it would release the light of truth to our inner man. God, we need truth. We need our spirits to be sharp to hear what you are saying to the church in this hour, and we bless your name. Amen. Well, we are living in an hour of great crisis. Erica mentioned this study manual that I've written. I encourage you to get it. I encourage you to go through it. But I want to read some facts that I include in that manual that I, I share with our students at the beginning of every semester just to give a sense of where we are at in the earth. It's very easy to be overwhelmed by the crisis in America or not overwhelmed by the crisis in America. But when we are confronted by the facts, our hearts get stung and we begin to ask the question, God, the state of the earth is in crisis. The earth is staggering under the weight of sin and darkness. God, what is the answer? It's from an understanding of the crisis of the hour, that the intercessory cry begins to arise, God, when will you bring justice? When will you release an answer for the oppressed of the earth? And when will you fill the earth with your glory? Consider the crisis at hand. Jesus said that in the end times, crisis and darkness would escalate. Isaiah said that deep darkness would cover the earth as the enemy comes in like a flood, seeking to sweep away multitudes for eternity into darkness. The nations are living under threat of natural disasters, terrorism, lawlessness, and war. The threat of radical Islam is growing. As of today, there are about 1.6 billion Muslims in the earth compared to 1.9 million Christians. A million Catholics, 900,000, 900 million, sorry, a billion Catholics, 900 million Protestants. Just 300 million less Muslims than Christians on the earth. And Muslims, are, uh, Islam is growing exponentially in a faster rate than Christianity. Though we celebrate the advances of the gospel, there is a crisis in which the evil one is prevailing at the moment in the, growth of, in the growth of Islam. And the branch of Islam that is growing the greatest is radical, militant Islam fueled by terrorism. Western governments at the same time are growing more tolerant. Perversion and darkness is not only occurring in hidden pockets. It is being legalized and celebrated in the open. There are two crises I want to look at before we look at the answer. And the one crisis is the fruit of God's people not understanding God's answer to the crisis in the nations. There is a crisis in the nations and there is a crisis in the church. Global poverty and disease Fueled by greed, blankets the earth. We live in an hour where three billion people live on less than $2.50 a day. A billion do not have enough to eat. And every five seconds on the earth, a child dies from hunger. One, two, three, four, five. Beloved, every time you send a tweet or message someone, a child is dying. Not from natural causes, but because that child does not have enough to eat. 25% of the earth's population consumes 75% of the resources and then protect their resources with arms up to the hilt. Global expenditure on war is about $1.15 trillion this year. 
Beloved, do you know how many times over the world could be fed and provided for for the money that is spent on the global war machine? When Isaiah says that in the day that Jesus reigns, swords will be turned into plowshares, God is not giving romantic imagery. He's saying, I am going to answer the crisis of world hunger by addressing the issue of war. Beloved, six million children each year die from preventable diseases. There is injustice and oppression on the earth. Consider the wars that are on the earth. Beloved, we were not created to fight one another, yet in the 20th century there were 200 million, thereabouts, deaths on the earth from war and from genocide. As of 2012, there were at least 12 regional conflicts across the earth in which over a thousand people die every year. There's a crisis in the Middle East that explodes at the least provocation. Bombs going this way and that way, creating all manner of instability. Poverty and a refugee crisis in Africa from the many tribal and regional conflicts. Consider that. 200 million people died from war in the 20th century. 200 million, the genocide of the Holocaust, the genocides of Stalin in the former Soviet Union, the genocides of Rwanda and in Africa and various other places. 200 million died, but beloved, the crisis is greater than that because the most dangerous place was not war in the 20th century, it was the mother's womb. For while 200 million people died in war and in genocide, almost 1 billion people were killed in their mother's womb through the tragedy of abortion. 1 billion infants, an entire generation. And beloved, nations have legislated for and nations have legislated against abortion. Annually, however, about 45 to 50 million abortions take place, and almost 50% of those take place in nations where abortion is illegal. Beloved, there is a crisis that goes beyond simply changing laws and a strategy of man, though that is good, and though we need to press for the shifting of legislation. There is a crisis that is bigger than the ability of man to answer. The abortion epidemic has been fueled by sexual immorality and perversion. People get pregnant because people want to exercise their freedom sexually. And in the last century, there's been a sexual revolution The very sanctity of marriage has come under siege. Sexual immorality is reaching heights of depravity unimaginable. Primetime TV is X-rated. It's R-rated. We can't watch it anymore or we shouldn't watch it anymore because what is on primetime TV is so depraved if we would step back and look at the standards of God's Word and see what we are agreeing with by filling our eye gate and our ear gate with what is coming through the TV. That's not to mention the freely... Beloved, this is not a matter of I am free to behave how I want to behave. Beloved, when you watch depravity... Through the media, you are coming into agreement with a lifestyle and a value system that is contrary to the kingdom of God. Do not expect God to release His power upon you when you are agreeing with darkness. For what does darkness have to do with the light? Do not fellowship, Paul says, with the hidden things of darkness. Rather, expose them. But we do not even know because we're like that proverbial frog in the pot. 
You put a frog in a pot, you heat the water up, that frog slowly dies. It doesn't realize the water is getting hotter and it slowly dies. If you were to take a new frog, this is, I've never done this, this is a proverb, and throw it into a pot of hot water, that frog would jump right out because it would feel the heat of the water. But beloved, as the body of Christ, we have immersed ourselves in a pot that is gradually heating up and we are slowly dying under the pressure of perversion and immorality in the hypersexualization of our culture, $97 billion a year, almost $100 billion a year, a couple of years ago, was being spent globally on pornography per year. That's not to mention the movies, the internet, the video games that sensualize and virtualize terror, violence, and sexual immorality. We get entertained from killing people and performing acts of gratuitous sin and excuse it in the name of entertainment and fun. Beloved, what fellowship does light have with darkness? This is a crisis. Beloved, it leads to an increase in prostitution. In Thailand alone, 2.8 million Women are prostituted, generating billions of dollars for their pimps because of the insatiable greed and lust for perversion. Slavery has become one of the greatest problems in our generation. We live in a generation in which slavery is illegal in every single nation. And yet there are 27 million plus slaves on the planet. And America is not immune. Almost 15,000 slaves are, 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 are trafficked into this nation every year. 15,000. Look around this room. That's everyone in this room. That's how many people are trafficked. How many thousands more are continuing to live in slavery in this nation? Human trafficking is a 32 billion per year industry. A million children are forced into prostitution each year. And the average cost of a slave, $90. $90. Some of you would not even think anything of spending that for a movie and a dinner date. $90. But there's more darkness. Terror and violence blanket the earth internationally. Militant Islam is raising its ugly head. Internationally, militant Islam is putting on a face that is being accepted in some areas by organizations like the United Nations. International violence, domestic terror. Beloved, it is not right that we live in a nation where in the past six months there have been four mass shootings in this nation. Something is seriously wrong. Darkness is seriously growing. 62 mass shootings in the last 30 years. Tragic when the very youngest and most innocent in our society are slain by those who are walking in darkness. I don't have time to talk about natural disasters, tsunamis, earthquakes, and hurricanes. Are there more than ever? I don't know. But what I do know is this. With the increase of urbanization and globalization, we are aware of their impact. We feel their impact deeply. When Hurricane Sandy came ashore, in New York a few weeks ago, we felt its impact deeply. Hurricanes have come and gone, but beloved, their impact is greater than ever. The nations are trembling under the threat of natural disasters. I don't have time to talk about the 150 million orphans on the earth and the curse of fatherlessness through AIDS, sickness and disease, a global drug trade valued at about $300 billion, which if it was a nation, the black market for drugs would be the 21st richest nation on the earth. Economic crisis, sexual violence in the homes, domestic abuse of various flavors, 
in the deep problem of loneliness. Beloved, deep darkness covers the earth. And many are interpreting the statistics about the darkness that covers the earth, and they come to the conclusion, if such wickedness can exist upon the earth, then God is not good. If such darkness can prevail upon the earth or seemingly prevail on the earth, then does God even exist? That was the conclusion of multitudes who survived the Holocaust of World War II. If this is what God is like and this is what God permits, God does not exist. And because of that, the authority of the Word of God and the reliability of the Word of God has been abandoned by multitudes who instead of trusting the Word of God as their final authority in matters of faith and matters of conduct have said, if this is the way it is, I'm rather going to join them than try and beat them. And so the church has abandoned the Word of God. The church has abandoned central doctrines about the nature of Jesus Central doctrines about the nature of salvation. Salvation has been about getting to heaven rather than about pleasing God and presenting yourself wholeheartedly before Him. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit has been abandoned because people have not seen His power and have determined because we have not seen His power, He is not powerful. People have abandoned Doctrines on the church, saying the church is full of problems, I'd rather live on my own. And we have abandoned the fear of the Lord by ignoring eschatology. And beloved, that's the fundamental problem. The body of Christ did not meditate on the plan of God. The body of Christ did not meditate on the solution of God. The body of Christ did not give herself to understanding the will and the purpose of God, and she lost the fear of the Lord, and she entered into great deception. And beloved, the Lord Jesus in Matthew 24 says, this is what the church of the end times is going to do. Multitudes are being carried away even today by their desire to engage in illicit pleasures. They're being swept away by convincing arguments that deceive them that a God of love does not exist because a God of love would not permit such crisis on the earth. And multitudes are trading allegiance to Jesus and His plan to allegiance to their plan and their efforts to bring justice in their own strength. And beloved, one day the devil is going to release a superman called the Antichrist who those people will agree with and he will seemingly have all the answers. And it started because God's people left their allegiance to God and to His Word. But I have good news for you this morning. God has a plan to remove injustice. God has a plan to fill the earth with His glory, to make every wrong thing right. Beloved, a day is coming when Jesus is going to be revealed from heaven in flaming fire and in glory, and He is going to wage war against all unrighteousness. He is going to take up His iron rod, and He is going to dash to pieces the nations that resist Him in their rebellion and say, we don't want a God to rule over us. Beloved, He is coming. He has a plan to bring justice on the earth. Why then does wickedness prevail? Why then the delay? Because, beloved, He is a God who desires that none should perish. He is a God who is patient, not wanting any to perish, and not taking delight even in the death of the wicked. And so He allows the tares to come to full maturity. Jesus told the parable of the wheat and the tares, and Jesus said the tares are going to come to fullness 
but I have an answer. The wheat is going to come to fullness too. When darkness prevails, bright light is going to break out upon my church, and it's going to culminate in the brightness of the coming of Jesus to the earth. Beloved, the crisis of the nations is not to be a cause for despair. It's not to be a cause for disillusion. The Bible tells us that wickedness will increase as we approach the Lord's return. But beloved, the earth will be filled with the glory of God. Stuart quoted Isaiah 42 yesterday, and I'm going to quote it again. Because in context to the crisis of injustice and the pressure The Lord wants us to behold His servant. He wants us to behold Jesus. He wants us to behold His plan. He wants us to understand that His soul delights in Jesus and His heart delights in the plan that He's going to execute through Jesus. Beloved, the reason God put His Spirit upon Jesus, according to Isaiah Chapter 42, verse 1, is that through Jesus, he would bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Beloved, the first time he came in meekness, he is tender to those who say yes to him. He will not raise the war cry against those who come in repentance and contrition and tremble at his word. He will not put out a smoldering wick. In your weakness, as you say yes, he says, I will embrace you and I will help you. But beloved, we have to understand, he is coming to make war against his enemies. And the conclusion of his plan to bring justice is that he comes as a judge and he rallies a war cry and he rallies a zeal and he will prevail against his enemies. He will prevail against his enemies. And he will establish justice for truth to the very ends of the earth. He will not be discouraged. Beloved, the Holy Spirit, Isaiah tells us, did not come upon Jesus simply to bring the favor of God to the oppressed. I hear so many times people say, we are living in the hour of the favor of the Lord. And that is true. Isaiah 61 verse 2 says, this is the year of God's salvation for the oppressed. It's the year of the favor of the Lord. It's the year to speak comfort because the glory of the death and resurrection provides a way for men and women to be free from sin. But to those who refuse, we have to understand that God anointed Jesus not only to show favor, but to bring vengeance against his enemies. Isaiah 61 verse 2, it's the year of his favor and it's the year of his judgment. There's no contradiction between the gentleness of Jesus as the tender bridegroom and the zeal of Jesus as the judge. The year of the Lord's favor as he sets the captives free is by necessity also the day of vengeance as he punishes his oppressors. Beloved, you don't set a captive free, and that captive will not feel safe until his or her oppressors are judged. It is two sides of the same coin. There is no contradiction. He is coming to release his glory, but he is coming to release his judgment. And the answer to the cry for justice Jesus said, is the breaking in of his kingdom at his return. Beloved, we pray your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth. And so often we are so vague about what that means. And as long as we stay vague about what the kingdom of God looks like, and what the will of God and the plan of God for the earth is, we will be vague and fuzzy and non-urgent in our prayers. But fueled by the revelation of the crisis of the hour and fueled by the understanding of the certain plan of God to end injustice, we will with urgency 
partner with Jesus in releasing that kingdom on the earth. There are two important dimensions to understand about the kingdom. The kingdom is future and the kingdom is present. The kingdom is future. Jesus is coming again to rule the nations. At the cross, he won the authority to enforce the rule of man over the head of the serpent. He won the authority not just to set human souls free, not just to dwell in humans, but he won the authority to redeem the whole earth and make every wrong thing right. Beloved, we are living in the hour of his return. I believe that within the lifetime of some of those in this room, he will return to confront unrighteousness. He will return to enforce the authority he won at Calvary. Psalm 2 tells us what that takeover plan is going to look like. It says the nations are going to be in a state of rage against God. The nations hate God. The earth hates God. The hatred and the wickedness of the nations will go to fullness and they will say, we want to live as we please. We don't want your rule. And Psalm 2 tells us God's response. He laughs. He laughs. Beloved, we're not in a war of two equals. God is sovereign and his son has all power. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. And he sits at the right hand of the Father, waiting to make all his enemies his footstool. And waiting until the Father says, you go and take possession of the kingdoms of the earth that you asked me for and make every wrong thing right. Beloved, Jesus is coming back. And we need to be familiar with the action plan because it is an action plan. The book of Revelation unfolds it in such detail and it is the most exciting plan you can imagine. Beloved, it is the good news of the kingdom. It is the good news that he is coming to rule and he is coming to reign. And the collateral damage is all we get terrified about. Beloved, the stuff we look at in the book of Revelation is all this negative stuff that's going to happen. But beloved, it has to happen because the nations are rebelling and the hour of his wrath has finally come. But he wants us in that hour not to be terrified, but to partner with him, crying out, even so, come Lord Jesus. We have separated ourselves from the crisis We have lived in bright righteousness, and we have been appointed to rule with you. Beloved, the end times is good tidings, as Isaiah said. But most of us look at it as bad news because we've not understood the glory in this plan. Jesus is coming to deal with darkness. Jesus is coming to remove injustice. Jesus is coming to bring righteousness, to fill the earth with his glory, and to prepare the earth for the coming of his Father, where the declaration is this, the dwelling place of God is now with man. We will be his people, and he will be our God. Oh, this is the blessed hope of the church. But for so many believers, it has become the blessed confusion. We read the end times and we're confused. And beloved, for the early church, it was their blessed hope. It was their longing. They were faced with the same reality that we are faced with. And they said, Jesus, we want you to come back. We want you to return. We want you to make wrong things right. It was what motivated their prayer. It was what caused them to arise and say, even so, come Lord Jesus. We long for your appearing. But the good news is this. We don't have to wait and sigh and do nothing until that day. For the kingdom 
is a future reality. But beloved, what Jesus invited us into at the day of Pentecost was to partner with him in seeing the kingdom established on the earth even now. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, and the kingdom is advancing, and those who will lay aside everything else to lay hold of me will see the kingdom break in in their generation. Beloved, he said the kingdom is not yet, but he said you will be witnesses of the kingdom now, not in word only, but in power. The works that I did, you also will do. Beloved, many people, I hear them say, oh, I wish Jesus would return, and I wish Jesus would return. I hear people say, I wish I'd been alive in the days when Jesus ministered in Galilee. Beloved, I'm glad I live today. Jesus said, it's better that I go away. He said to his disciples, you will be better because though I was with you in Galilee, when I pour out the Spirit, I'll be in you. I'll be in you. And I will move out of you to establish my rule with gospel power, healing, signs, wonders, the demonstration of the age to come in the present. Beloved, we don't have to choose between the not yet and the now. We need to pursue both in the same, in the same reality, in the same fervency. It is the longing for His return and the vision for what He is coming to do on the earth at His return that opens up the parameters of what He might give us in the now. Both dimensions of the kingdom are released through a people who pray, the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let your reign be established in fullness at your return and as much as you want through my life. Beloved, he didn't say how much we could have now. He didn't limit us. He said, what's your vision? The whole earth will not be restored until Jesus returns. But he didn't put a ceiling on what was possible for us if we will contend in prayer, if we will do what he said John the Baptist did, lay aside everything that hinders and with spiritual intensity or spiritual violence pursue the things of the kingdom. Lay aside sin, lay aside everything that entangles and make room for the Holy Spirit to rest upon you. Beloved, Isaiah said that in the hour of great darkness, a great light would be seen upon God's people. But he said we've got to arise and we've got to shine. Beloved, it's a choice. It will not happen automatically. The greatest outpouring of the Spirit that has ever been seen will be released upon the church before the return of Jesus. And the Lord will thrust forth laborers into the harvest field of every sphere of society doing the works of Jesus, representing the Word of Jesus, and living the life of Jesus. But He says to us, Will you arise? Will you shine? Will you come before me? And will you ask me to release my kingdom on the earth? Will you ask me for the greater works than these? Will you ask me for your city? Will you ask me for the human trafficking industry? Will you ask me for the porn industry? Will you ask me for the poor of the earth and the lost of the earth? and the children of the earth, and the orphans of the earth, because I want to release my light in the darkness as a great witness to the truth of my kingdom, and then the end will come. Beloved, we don't have to choose. Our blessed hope and the answer to the crisis of the hour is that Jesus is going to release justice to the earth. I'm going to have the worship team come. Our blessed hope is that one day Jesus will restore all things. But beloved, 
a blessed invitation is that we are invited to partner with Him today. Beloved, we have a blessed hope, but we have a blessed invitation. And God is looking for those in an hour in which darkness blankets the nations as it did in Elijah's day would arise and embrace the spirit of Elijah that they might walk in the power of the kingdom and see a nation and the nations turn to the Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Beloved, it's not going to happen automatically, but it will happen. When the enemy comes in like a flood, our blessed hope is this, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. That standard is Jesus, and that standard is Jesus in us. And beloved, He's looking for a people who will fight earnestly who will wage war against sin and contend for the kingdom to be manifest in the day to come, but in tomorrow's daily workday, wherever we are, in the school, in the workplace, wherever we are, Holy Spirit, here we are. It takes energy. It takes effort. It takes a setting of our heart. We've got to arise. A lot of us, we just say, oh, we'll just sit and God will do it. No, he says, arise and shine. Take action. Take action. Make decisions. I'm not going to sit with those people and live in that way and feast my eyes and my ears on those things. I'm not going to defile my conscience with that which comes on my mouth. Lord, you want to use me to see your kingdom established on the earth. I present myself to you, Lord. Let me not see what the minimum is you will give me in my generation. Let me be one who sees the breaking in of the kingdom with power in my workplace, in my school, in my generation, Lord. Raise up those like Wesley, Whitfield, Finney, John G. Lake, David Brainerd, God, those who would give you no rest until you have your inheritance in the earth. Raise up those like Adoniram Judson. Raise up those like the Moravians who for the sake of your kingdom and the sake of your glory sold themselves into slavery. We say yes to this call, Lord. We will arise. We will shine with your righteousness. We will proclaim the gospel of a kingdom that is going to take over every other kingdom. And we will proclaim that the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Touch us. Empower us. Release vision upon our hearts. Awaken fresh vision for those who have got stuck in a rut. Awaken fresh vision for those who have dormant prophetic words to lay hold of you until you release the promise in them and then through them. Lord, we love you. Give us more. How much will you give us? We say yes. Oh, we say yes to the blessed hope. Come, Lord Jesus. Come Come for us. Oh, but Lord, let us be a people that you have come to while we are waiting and while we are watching. Amen. Beauty, beauty, beautiful. Glory, glory, glorious. You are. You are.
for 